Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, many thanks to the organizers of this superb conference, uh, Leah and Jill. Um, this is a topic that very much needs to be addressed. Now, as I am a Canadian, I must begin by apologizing, and my apology will be twofold, if not threefold. I was gathering extra points uh, for which I need to apologize during the keynote speech where he mentioned a few uh, salient Canadian points, such as not protecting 1984, um, for which I apologize, um, <laughs> and uh, deeming only information with commercial value worthy of protection, for which, again, I need to apologize on behalf of my compatriots. But most relevant, um, I, I, I think, is the fact that um, I will unfortunately need to leave after my talk, which is extremely awkward, and I hope you will forgive me in order to uh, catch a flight. Um, but I was already, I think, adequately punished by having to follow the wonderful keynote speech, which is going to cause <laughs> tremendous stress and tremendous nervousness. Um, so I, I, I appreciate your understanding for that. Um, in the movie Social Network, Mark Zuckerberg's ex-girlfriend exclaims in frustration that the internet isn't written in pencil, it's written in ink. And indeed, much ink has been proverbially spilled discussing the end of forgetting or lamenting the internet's infinite memory. Um, as I did, writing about litigants' privacy. So why don't we put um, all case law online? Well, there might be reasons, but reasons that we won't discuss today. I warn judges, for example, that while not reliable, the unprecedented accessibility of fragments of information risks giving rise to more and more allegations um, where bits of information are regrouped. The internet has infinite memory, I had said. Something posted risks haunting you 18, 30 years later. A sort of uh, interesting example that came up once again in, in Canada um, last week is of an elite uh, high school teacher who was just fired, uh, the lady is 73 years old, because pictures of her in a, um, I don't know how to label it, an erotic or even pornographic movie that she had made literally over 40 years ago in France now showed up online. So uh, uh, that, uh, uh, and they said, well, the internet brings the past into the present. And we talk about the end of forgetting, and we heard a Mark Twain quote, and the Mark Twain quote or paraphrase that I usually use is, um, the, a lie can make halfway, its way halfway around the world until the truth can put its boots on. That's all the more so true in the Internet. Right to be forgotten. We're all concerned about the Internet not forgetting. Why do I mention that? Um, because this conference is, first of all, unusual for Internet scholars and jurists. We're always talking about the difficulty of erasure and how speech might be chilled and frustrate the quintessentially American concept of reinvention online. But the difficulty we are addressing today, and this is really a first for me, and I think a first for many, very few have heard of this problem. We are all talking about the end of forgetting. But here we are for the first time, I think, that I remember, um, and hopefully the first of many, uh, addressing the need of remembering. Um, so here's the flip side. Where we want the internet to be more permanent, where we want information online to be more durable, it is not. So if I can make one point um, and, and nothing else today, it is that we need to foster this shift in thinking. We need to revisit this notion of internet permanence um, and point to instances where this is not at the end of forgetting, but might be the end of remembering in certain contexts which with very significant um, ramifications. So uh, again, this is extremely important in terms of fostering awareness, uh, uh, perhaps outside of library circles, amongst jurists, amongst practitioners, amongst judges, in terms of judicial education, where uh, very few are aware of this problem. And the notion of the end of forgetting has become cliche, especially after the recent ECJ decision, uh, which you may or may not uh, be aware of forcing uh, to some extent, and we do not know yet to what extent, search engines to remove unsavory uh, content for reasons that I think the above mentioned example points to. So in this vein, Meg Ambrose, who challenged the notion of internet permanence in a different context, may be entirely correct. Data is not always permanent, and while the internet may be great at remembering, 
that we express certain views we'd rather not be associated with uh, when we were 17, which now may have serious ramifications preventing us from uh, getting a job or finding an apartment or uh, adequate date or becoming a Supreme Court justice. Uh, information, it tends to forget information that we cite, rely on, and need to remember. Needless to say, uh, this is why we are here, and the seriousness is exacerbated by when the information is evidence adduced by attorneys or cited by court. That sort of information vanishing does extreme violence to the stability of precedent, transparency of justice, and reliability of precedent, uh, which in the long run can have a very disturbing cumulative effect on stare decisis. Luckily, I come... Uh, I'm originally from Quebec from a civil law system, so we understood a few hundred years ago that stare decisis wasn't such a great idea to begin with. So we would survive <laughs> only by holding the civil code. We have this one book that, in theory, um, encompasses all of law, the Napoleonic Code, the idea that one must hold law in their hands. So that's all we need. So we wouldn't even need to have this conference or any of this creative innovation. But that's in theory. So uh, a great threat to the stability and foreseeability of law. Uh, Barger, and again, you know, when I was writing on point, I had to look outside the field of law because there was uh, very little, if next to nothing, written on point. So, whereas librarians have, have, a, such as, uh, uh, have written quite a bit, uh, Barger, whose study tangibly confirms the predicament, aptly summarizes the serious consequences of improper uh, use of e-sources. And, and I'm quoting now, when a court pur pur purportedly bases its understanding of the law or the law's application to case facts upon a source that cannot subsequently be located or confirmed, the significance of the citation to that source becomes ominous. If the present readers of the opinion cannot determine how much persuasive excuse me, weight was or should be accorded to the unavailable source, they have little reason to place much confidence in the opinion's authoritativeness. And I'm continuing the citation in a word the lack of authoritativeness and durability effectively cripples the Internet's ability to tell courts anything of real substance about the reality it purports to depict. Even worse, it risks distorting future courts' understanding and creating a body of precedent written in the wind, quote, without textured characterization in the absence of any meaningful locatability, end of quote. So the Internet what does it mean for us, appears to be what we call in French, and, and you know, normally in Canada conferences are bilingual, I realize this is not, so I will limit myself to one quick sentence, a couteau à double tranchant, a two-edged sword, permanence where we don't want it, and transience or precariousness where we require longevity. And I think its attention must be attracted to the second aspect that is next to unknown in most circles outside of, obviously, uh, library circles such as this. It preserves where perhaps it should forget and forgets where it needs not to. So while everyone is busy introducing more forgetting, uh, a little more remembering would not be such a bad thing. And, and I'm glad um, uh, to see that many solutions have been dealt with. I won't I'll dwell on the ominous problems rather than on the solutions, which I think um, have already begun to be addressed and will be later addressed again. So if we achieve little else today, I think bringing awareness to this problem in circles of judges, in circles of jurists, beyond circles of, of uh, librarians and uh, related professions is a crucial first step. How does this unwanted forgetting played out? Um, so my greatest fear, at least in the context of this conference, I, uh, materialized this morning because I had the same example of Justice Alito and uh, the Brown versus Entertainment <laughs> Merchants Association. But I think this is probably the only example that um, was uh, effectively presented by the keynote, so I won't uh, repeat it. Of course, um, Adam Lipsack of the New York Times uh, provided many examples of specific cases that led to an error message and uh, no longer work. I will point to another salient concern related to link rot, which is that of independent judicial research. Um, independent judicial research has always been a contentious matter, uh, but it's now further complicated by the phenomenon of link rot and other issues of unreliable internet sources. Can judges conduct independent research? Can judges Google? 
That is a separate issue in terms of law and ethics, but Lincroft further complicates this matter. Uh, advances in communication have brought the world's library to the courthouse, so you no longer have to engage in those onerous trips across town, but when judges feel the need for additional information, the easy availability of the internet is a very powerful temptation. So I just got the five minute warning. Um, <laughs> so uh, judges will search online, but they will not always know how to distinguish between those sources that are reliable and other sources that are not. Um, so the internet for reasons of reliability and traceability exacerbates the concerns that were traditionally associated with independent judicial research. And I'm going to quote now retired Canadian Justice Binney, who explained this better than I ever could. Reasons for judgment are the primary mechanism by which judges account to the parties and to the public for the decisions that they render. Public access to the court's thought processes, and I think this is the key, public access to the court's thought processes is an integral element of the much cherished value of transparency and form the basis of the public's confidence in the judiciary. These thought processes, however, if they cannot be submitted to proper scrutiny, be it public scrutiny, academic scrutiny, or appellate scrutiny, that scrutiny cannot happen unless the sources that nourish the decision are clearly identifiable. So that's the major problem. Um, what must we do? I will leave it to other speakers, but I will mention one quick, uh, just a, a, a quick prepackaged uh, solution. First of all, I think training and awareness is very important. Um, I've said to judges in the context of judicial training in the past uh, that before they turn to internet sources, they need to uh, try to scope out the brick and mortar world in terms of citation, uh, proper citation practices, avoiding certain sources, so distinguishing between the fly-by-night sources, um, sources that are likely to change quite often, like Wikipedia and the like, so uh, is, is, um, is extremely important. And um, not allowing traditional sources of legal authority to loosen, uh, as is uh, the uh, obvious impact of the internet culture, if nothing else. And thirdly, and I think this is what has already be begun to be addressed and will be addressed, Authenticating and preserving, of course, fostering a structured and uniform approach to cyber materials, and the Ninth Circuit has already begun that. Begun that, excuse me, and we've talked about um, PERMA, and I think U of T has a uh, similar system to which it is linked. Um, and uh, I thank you once again for your patience and apologize for my um, untimely departure. <laughs> Our next speaker will be David Walls from the U.S. Government Printing Office. David? Well, good morning. I'm David Walls from the United States Government Printing Office. And I bring greetings from our superintendent of documents, Mary Alice Bache, who was originally scheduled to be on the program today but was unable to do so. I know that she uh, deeply re regrets not being able to be here with you all. Today I'm going to talk about, I should advance. Today I'm going to talk about prevention against loss, strategic directions for permanent public access to federal legal government information. I'd like to begin my talk today by revisiting some of the things that we learned in school, but retelling the story reminds us of its importance to the topic of today's conference. The writings of the Declaration of Independence, of the author of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, and the father of the Constitution, James Madison, both contain principled arguments that in order for the American people to be their own governors, they had to have access to information about what their government was doing. Establishing the principle that informed citizens were the foundation of democratic government the work of Benjamin Franklin and other printers helped establish that the rule of law would be based on the printing and public availability of legal statutes and other official information. This fixity in print of authentic government information provided for citation and support of legal precedent. 
Support for keeping the people informed about their government became the basis of a joint resolution of Congress passed in 1813. This act provided for the printing and distribution of important government publications to each state and territorial government, and eventually to libraries within that state. And by 1861, the federal government had grown to the point that it was doing a lot more printing, and it was tired of being overcharged and having unreliable printing from a variety of contractors, so it formed the government printing office as a source of authentic government information in the United States. By 1895, the program of information distribution was reorganized under a new statute forming the Federal Depository Library Program. So now the library dissemination program of information is connected with the source of all official authentic government information. And access and preservation of that government information and legal publications is through a geographically distributed network of libraries. The mission of this new program, the Federal Depository Library Program, is to provide no fee, ready, and permanent public access to federal government information now and for future generations. And the Federal Depository Library Program, in its vision, will provide government information when and where it is needed in order to ensure an informed citizenry and an improved quality of life. So authentic legal government information is now publicly available in this program to citizens in all 50 states and six U.S. territories. Authentication is by GPO, fixity and print, preservation through geographic distribution. And you knew that when you picked up a publication, if you saw the colophon that it was printed by the government printing office, you knew that it was official, authentic government legal information. But along comes something that we've talked about this morning. This is one of these uh, scenes which is sort of happens in science fiction movies where um, dimensions, uh, pan-dimensional beings cross over dimensions, because it was about this much of a shift. The internet brought disruptive technology. We've talked about the web being a dynamic system. Webster's defines a dynamic system as something that's constantly changing and that the activity of change is inevitably, perhaps not from what we've heard a lot this morning, towards progress. In this new dynamic world of information, people who have been charged with providing permanent public access to government information find themselves in the position of having to develop correspondingly dynamic information systems and strategies to mitigate link rot, lot, link, link rot and lost information. Because the government publications we now knew through the fixity of paper and print now look like this. What, caused, uh, what it caused was an explosion overnight in federal agencies electing to publish on the web and not in print. And yet the mission for the program to provide permanent public access to this information didn't change. And government information librarians find themselves faced with a sea of new information trying to make sense of it for their patrons and readers. And dealing with so much information not cataloged, not available for discovery, simply in the wilderness of the World Wide Web. But in reacting to the internet appropriately, the government's response was the invention to the invention of the internet was two important pieces of legislation. The first was the Electronic Information Enhancement Act way back in 93. So think back to when the internet was invented. The government already had a fairly robust response to that by 93, which was to allow GPO to create what was GPO access, the predator of the uh, predecessor to the federal digital system. But the second piece of legislation from 1996 really answers the question, who has the obligation to prevent link rot and maintain permanent public access? This law, which was a public law for the study for the transition to a more electronic federal depository library program, has a number of interesting features. It outlined five important principles. 
The principles of government information, first, is that the public has a right of access to information. Two, that the government has the obligation to disseminate that information and to provide broad public access. That the government has an obligation to guarantee the authenticity and integrity of its information. And from my standpoint as a preservation librarian, of great importance is, is the government has an obligation to preserve its information. And in an era of commercial publishing, that the government information created or compiled by government employees or at government expense should remain in the public domain. So some of the strategic direction that we have developed in answer to this dynamic system of the internet is I mentioned the formation of GPO access, which became FDCIS in 29. We've begun robust web archiving We've begun harvesting the e-books that federal agencies are putting up on the web for downloading, developing mobile apps, a study of the community to see if our direction was appropriate to what they were thinking, and we had some affirmation in a study by the National Academy of Public Administration that I'll mention in a moment, and are working toward developing a comprehensive plan for the preservation of government information. And most recently, we, we've begun a collaborative effort with NARA and the Library of Congress to make sure we're not all harvesting the same portion of the web and leaving important bits out. For GPO's federal digital system, what this represents is a digital repository, but it's also a source of authentic, authentic information with integrity through checksums, hashtagging, chain of custody for ingest, and premise metadata indicating changes to data. But for the audience here today, importantly for legal information, the content now contains the opinions of the federal courts, such as the appellate courts, district courts, and bankruptcy courts. And while many of these opinions are available on the individual courts' websites, Authenticating and preserving these courts' opinions on FDCIS ensures their preservation and access, but also it allows these opinions to be searched across other statutory and regulatory content already on FDCIS. And the addition of opinions from other courts, such as the Court of Inter International Trade, will soon follow. There's also a lot of digitization of tangible, paper-based, legal publications that are being done by libraries within the program. And we have created a digitization projects registry to facilitate some of that digitization. This is a space where people can talk about their projects, look for partners, see if there's any overlap with anything anyone else is doing. And once government, government information moves to the web, we needed to ramp up our web archiving and harvesting program. We've been harvesting publications since 1996, but we've uh, significantly increased that with a uh, new partnership with the Internet Archives, Archive at Service, which I know you're going to hear about later today on the program. One of the ways to ward off link rot and lost information, we believe, is that cataloging is vitally important to discovery and access, as well as allowing the catalog of government publications to serve as an important database of <coughs> record for preservation and collection management data. And everything that we add to FDCIS, everything that we harvest, will have a record in the catalog of government publications with live persistent links to the source content. In addition to these strategies against loss, we felt the need to get some additional feedback from our user community the Federal Depository Librarians. So in 2012, I was privileged um, to work on a survey asking the community their opinions on the important topics you see in the box on the left. The results of this survey were extremely valuable in providing the support we needed to develop important initiatives for the life cycle management of government information. They gave us feedback on changes to the governance and structure of the program and the need for additional services to libraries. And one of the things that they really ask us to do is to do a whole lot more webinars and training and engagement with them about topics that they were interested in. 
while we were working on our community study, we got some unexpected affirmation for the strategic direction that came from a congressional study. Congress asked the National Academy of Public Administration to look into the, uh, the working of the government printing office and the result was a, title, was a report titled Rebooting the Government Printing Office, Keeping America Informed in the Digital Age. And the panel recommendations were, as you can see on the left, uh, increased collaboration, life cycle management, the development of a comprehensive preservation plan. The outcomes of the working group describes the need for a preservation plan for both tangible and digital government information and suggests that we should develop projects to test our assumptions and methods. So it doesn't really get any better than for Congress to uh, tell you that you really should be doing what you'd already kind of planned to do anyway, but <laughs> we'll take it. It's, it's a wonderful uh, affirmation and support for us. So we recognize that the job of preserving federal legal government information is too huge for one agency to accomplish alone. We see the comprehensive plan as part of a larger preservation effort involving a network of partners assisting us in a national preservation effort. And here you see a model of just some of the ways we're exploring and beginning a discussion of some of the various facets that uh, partners may work with us on various projects. And so we set about setting goals for the comprehensive plan for the preservation of government information. And you can see that these goals are pretty ambitious. But we recognize that we are stewards of an information asset that is vitally important to the American people. And wouldn't it be great if all government information was cataloged, described from 1789 to the present and freely accessible? The preservation of dynamic content on the web requires collaboration with partners, especially in the web archiving community, who are all working to capture and preserve web content. Collaboration allows us to multiply our strengths, diminish our chances of wasteful duplication, and uh, the mistakes that everybody makes by trying to go it alone. These are some of our important partners, um, the Library of Congress, the National Archives, the Internet Archives Archive It folks have been wonderful to us. And we are also, with the Library of Congress, members of an international group that seeks to figure out how best to harvest the web, called the International Internet Preservation Consortium. So I mentioned you can't really go it alone. Um, the scope of the preservation problem and the ambitious goals that we set requires important partnerships. Some of our partnerships that you see on this list are for cataloging, digitization, web archiving, and the hosting of digital content. And we believe that the permanent public access to federal government information requires creative strategic thinking, the development of the strategic initiatives that I've talked about, community outreach, widespread collaboration, and the development of important partnerships to leverage efforts that we're leading. We believe that together these efforts are the basis of a plan of prevention against loss. So you've got questions or comments or you would like to find me and discuss potential areas of collaboration, <laughs> then please do. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Last up on our panel, we have Ed Walters, who's the CEO of FastCase. Ed? Uh, thank you, Jill. Thank you all for having me here today. Um, so um, I had prepared a, a very elaborate uh, presentation of gibberish using SciGen. <laughs> um, Jay-Z has kind of ruined that for me, so we're off to plan B. Um, this is plan B. We're going to talk about um, what link rot looks like from the perspective not of a you know, large, very well-established 
government institution like the GPO, but for a teeny tiny publisher uh, like Fastcase. Um, this is sort of our, our program for today. I also would like to talk a little bit about PermaCC as well. Uh, what we at Fastcase like about PermaCC and uh, a couple of challenges we have with it and a couple of ways it might evolve to become even more useful. So um, I'm going to start with kind of hyperlinks 101, what hyperlinks look like when you're trying to publish the law. Uh, here's an opinion from last term. This is the uh, Chouette opinion, the Michigan affirmative action case. And if you read through to uh, Justice Sotomayor's dissent, you'll see in it uh, a little hyperlink. This is a link to the League of Women Voters 2005 General Election Voter Guide. Uh, it's very well documented. Actually, this is kind of a model for legal citation to the internet. You'll see that some diligent clerk, or maybe Justice Sotomayor herself, actually says, you know, this was last visited April 18th, 2014, and we've saved a copy of it uh, with the clerk of court's uh, case file. Uh, so you can always get an authoritative copy of it in paper if you need to. Uh, this is nice. So Justice Sotomayor has made the contents of this web page a part of our American legal history tradition, right? It's cited in a Supreme Court opinion. Now it becomes a part of our law, right? This is a PDF from the court's website, and it's actually a hyperlink. So if you hover over the citation, you'll see your little cursor changes into a Mickey Mouse finger, so you can click it and actually visit that website. Okay, so this is what it looks like in Fastcase. You see the same citation in there. I've made a little red box around it. This is the product of a lot of hard work. It kind of looks the same, but it's the result of a lot of effort. So actually, every night, um, our team scours the web. We visit every court's website, all of the PACER websites, every legislature, every agency, every source of public law in the world, thousands and thousands of uh, sites, and pull down everything that's new, all of the increments that happened in the last day, so it will be uh, freshly baked in the morning at 7 o'clock uh, the next morning on Fastcase. Um, so uh, this is what it looks like in Fastcase on the front end. Um, and this is what it looks like in the back. So we're displaying these things on the web. We actually don't print books, right? It's kind of web only. And to get under the hood just a little bit, but not a lot, every judicial opinion, every statute, everything is an individual XML file. It means it has little elements in it. We've tagged metadata, things like the name of the court, the name of the author, the date, the docket number. And one of the elements in that XML file is a tag that says case HTML. But basically it just means when you show this case, here's the HTML that you display in the browser to make the case look formatted and pretty and nice, right? And this is what that HTML looks like under the hood. You can see things like paragraph tags in HTML. It's quite simple. Uh, but the actual hyperlink itself has a problem. It's just text, right? There's no hyperlink in it. Um, and that's... Uh, that reflects some decisions we've made, right? We've actually made the decision not to create a hyperlink. And one of the reasons for that, quite frankly, is link rot. Um, so uh, that's what it looks like under the hood. If we wanted to make a hyperlink, this is what you would do. You'd actually add like a little a href tag in the beginning, open quote, put the destination on the web where you would point the browser to if someone clicked on that link. Then you close the quotes, close the tag, show the text that you want to be hyperlinked, and then ultimately you close the little link. You can see it right there. It's not super fancy. It wouldn't be very hard to do. Um, and uh, if we did that for the Shuek case, if we actually created that hyperlink and displayed it in Fastcase, and somebody clicked that link, this is the page that it would resolve to. Um, this is classic link rot. By the way, um, recall that this case was la this page was last visited not you know April 18th of 1994, April 18th. 2014, six months, gone, okay? Link rot in action. As an aside, by the way, the Supreme Court actually holds publication of uh, opinions in the U.S. reports, right? Uh, they come out a little bit later because they wait for all of the pagination and the official citations to become final, right? You don't actually get the paper copy of the U.S. reports with blank citations in it. We wait until the citations are complete the citations to the books, that is, right? We don't hold publication of the United States reports for final versions of the hyperlinks. 
which in some case will never be final, right? Slight anomaly there. Okay, so with a little bit of work, uh, PermaCC could solve this problem. You, uh, you actually go and you find the League of Women Voters website and the asset itself. Uh, with a little bit of searching, you, you can actually find it. That voter guide still exists on the web. Um, and then you submit it to PermaCC, and you can create uh, a permalink right here. So, and you can see this is the success page. I've actually now created a PermaCC link for this uh, vanished asset uh, from the Supreme Court. So if we wanted to, we could actually add that PermaCC link into the hyperlink in FastCase. This is what it would look like. You'd actually, instead of linking to the League of Women Voters website, you would link to PermaCC. This would be completely invisible to the user if we did it this way. Uh, so you would just still see the link to the League of Women Voters website. But when you click the link, you'd actually get the PermaCC archive of it, protected, permanent, uh, solved, right? Um, okay, so that's, that's a, a kind of a simple look at how PermaCC might help solve the link rot problem for a publisher. Um, it's also a little bit of a friction-free plane. Uh, let's talk about some of the challenges and problems uh, as we go forward. Okay, so, um, what do publishers do with these hyperlinks in judicial opinions? I think the answer is going to be very different for each individual publisher. What FastCase does with it is different from what Thomson Reuters Legal does with it, which is different from what Justia does with it. Everyone is going to have a slightly different protocol, okay? Here's what we do with it. We actually ignore them. Put our fingers in our ears and say, la, 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 la. We pretend the hyperlink doesn't exist. Uh, in part because we don't have a working solution to the link rot problem. I don't want to spend a lot of resources trying to create hyperlinks that won't work anyway. Let's find a good working solution and then create the hyperlinks, right? In the meantime, the link is there. I mean, if someone wanted to copy it and paste it in their browser, they could still resolve the hyperlink, I suppose, but it's lame. I mean, that's an extra step and it's kind of terrible. So this, this sort of describes the problem and what it looks like um, on FastCase. Uh, let me describe the kind of uh, um, dimensions of this. So I did a little bit of uh, back of the envelope research uh, before this. And uh, I looked for hyperlinks in case law, right, anywhere in case law. And uh, what I came up with is about 68,000 hyper or documents with hyperlinks in them. Not 68,000 hyperlinks, but when you search for hyperlinks, you get 68,000 results. Um, and uh, as you might expect, a lot of those are recent, right? So uh, 12,442 of those hyperlinks were in 2013 alone. 2014 will break that record, and I'm sure 15 will as well. Um, this isn't too precise. I wouldn't, you know, say this is an exact number, but I think in the order of magnitude, it's probably very close to this. Um, and as a caveat, this is case law only. This is only judicial opinions, not statutes, not regs, not court, not court rules, not constitutions. You'll find hyperlinks all throughout the American law corpus, right? But this is a number just for case law. So uh, I like uh, PermaCC as a solution to this problem. Um, uh, here are some challenges we might face uh, in using PermaCC. I would say the first challenge is permanence. Um, so First of all, when you create that PermaCC link, uh, it doesn't vest right away. As, uh, as Professor Zetrain said this morning, someone needs to adopt it. And right now, there's something like you know, 50,000 uh, citations that are waiting to be adopted by a court. So already, as soon as you create it, there's sort of a permanence issue. But even beyond that, you know, the near-term issue is dwarfed by the long-term issue. Are we going to resolve these things with PermaCC 100 years from now? I know that sounds a little bit ridiculous, but when you're creating these collections at the cost of tens of millions of dollars, the uh, you know, software geek in me says PermaCC solves the problem completely. My inner archivist says 100 years from now, this could be a problem. You couldn't ask for a better, more responsible group of people than the hosting libraries who are working with PermaCC. Um, but again, you have all kinds of data failure problems funding problems, uh, there's even a problem with the history of the web, right? Are we going to be using the World Wide Web 100 years from now? Probably not. Okay, so my, 
my software geek says perma CC no problem. My inner archivist says we might have something of a permanence problem. Um, second is a version problem. Okay, are we looking at the same version of the page? Justice Sotomayor writes an opinion in April um, and creates a hyperlink. When I come back to it, um, when the bound volume comes out two years later, and I see the link in there, and I try to resolve it, will I get to the same page? Will it have changed? If the court links to a Wikipedia article, what guarantee do I have that when I later come back to it, 10 minutes later, that I'm even looking at the same page? Authentication is a special challenge. Um, uh, again, this is my inner archivist, but as soon as you change that document, um, you really don't have the same authenticity as the original, right? If I add a perma CC link in there, it actually changes the underlying document. And that's just for the web. If you do it for print, if you make that link a perma CC link for print, it actually is no longer accurate to the source. Um, there's a volume issue. So uh, at 12,400 citations or documents during a year, you're looking at about 60 citations a day. Uh, that's hard to hand tag, and that's just going forward. The back file is obviously much bigger. To actually go through and create perma CC links for all the back file, order of magnitude, about seven person years. That assumes you're looking at about you know, 10 minutes to create an individual perma CC site for each one of these links sort of along that friction-free plane. And by the way, uh, the seven people probably wouldn't look like this. They'd probably look more like this. Um, <laughs> it's hard. The back file would be a real challenge. Um, you know, and that's, you know, that's based on just an estimate. Um, that's just for Fastcase, by the way. So Fastcase would have seven person years worth of work to go perma CC the back file, right? But you'd also have that same problem from Thomson Reuters, for LexisNexis, for Justia, for Lois Law, for Bloomberg Law, for Casemaker, for the Free Law Project, for Versus Law. I'm sure I'm leaving people out, right? There are all kinds of archivists who are going to be having this problem multiplied times, you know, 68,000 uh, cases with citations in them, case law only. So back of the envelope, you'd be putting about 200 person years into the effort of perma CCing the archive if it's left to the publishers. So that is really the rub of my talk. Whose problem is this? Um, the short answer is, is David's. <laughs> I kid. Um, whose problem is this? I, I think the, the where you sit uh, kind of depends on where you stand. As a small publisher, I think my natural impulse is to say the real solution to this problem would be at the creation side. When you write a judicial opinion, creating a PERMA CC link along with a hyperlink is the easiest thing in the world, at least for the collection going forward. And that has a lot of advantages. Um, it preserves the exact version of the page that you are looking at, that you're referring to, right at the time when you're making it. So you don't have that time ambiguity. Um, it resolves the disambiguity problem if the page disappears, you know, and then you have someone actually going to look for the same assets somewhere else. Uh, it creates a single PERMA CC link instead of a different PERMA CC link for Fastcase and Westlaw and LexisNexis and everybody else. There's one link authenticated at the time uh, that resolves for everyone, right? And it also might be an additional uh, index of authoritativeness for the vesting agent when they see it's coming from the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, so here's my colophon. Um, I actually like PERMA CC as a solution for this problem. I think it would be great if the creators of the materials were actually to invest in creating PERMA CC links when they create hyperlinks for all the myriad reasons that I said. But I want to underscore the importance of preserving these things, right? I mean, our law is a cathedral. It may be the greatest accomplishment of our species. Our law carries forward a, court, a code of ethics that dates back to the Code of Hammurabi, the Bible, Roman law. It contains elements of the Napoleonic Code, of English common law, of early colonial law and American common law over the years. Our law is a cathedral, and we, the people sitting in this room today, we are its stewards, and we are watching every day as that law erodes to link rot. It feels like a small problem. It's a huge problem. So I, uh, I would just 
challenge you. Be a part of the solution. Become a vesting library, help resolve the links, and help educate the courts and legislatures to the problem of link rot and what the solution looks like. Our law is a cathedral. We are, our steward. we are its stewards. It's time to take this seriously and take back the problem of link rot. Thank you. Okay, we have about five minutes for questions, so if anybody has any. We have a microphone up front just to remind you in case, um, in case we, uh, you have a question for our speakers or if we have any uh, coming in from Twitter or the webcast. Come on, y'all, don't be shy. I'll, I'll start with a question. Uh, you know, Ed, how, how easy or, or hard was it to make the decision not to make links automatically clickable and fast case? Uh, it's a really hard decision. I mean, so we, uh, we face a number of issues like that. I think uh, our first impulse is to do no harm. Mm -hmm. So um, we had a similar issue with statutes. Um, we have all these citations of statutes over, you know, 200 years of American case law. The easiest thing in the world would be to create a link from, you know, a 1950 case um, that cites a statute to that statute in 2014. But it's, of course, completely wrong, right? You would need to have a version of that statute as it was in 1950. Uh, so we don't create a hyperlink to the wrong statute for historical materials. And hyperlinks are the same thing. Mm -hmm. Instead of creating a lot of work to make dead hyperlinks, we basically just said, hold. There's going to be a solution to this problem. Uh, I'm sure David's going to figure it out. Uh, <laughs> or, you know, uh, the people in this room will figure it out. Maybe PermaCC is finally that solution. Uh, by the way, um, a little API uh, to allow bulk submission of uh, citations for PermaCC would make a big difference to any of you listening. OK. And uh, <laughs> Dave Zavanich has solved that problem up front. Um, and then um, also a disambiguator. So publishers are going to do this, um, finding a way to say that link in its current form already exists in PermaCC. You're submitting a link for a second time, um, but you need to hash the underlying source. That's a kind of a longish answer to your question. Very hard. 